Kitchen and Sukanya Wignaraja, uh, members of the Board of Management of LKI, Darshana Gunasekara of MJF Holdings, officers of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this inaugural lecture of Dr. Ganeshan Wignaraja at LKI. I must emphasize the at LKI part because Ganesh has been so in demand since the day he set foot here that uh, unsurprisingly this is more like his 10th lecture overall. Uh, I think we had to hire additional interns just to answer the phones which have been ringing off the hook. I want to say a little about how LKI gained such a sought after expert, partly because we're lucky to have with us today key actors in that story and partly because the story is an exemplar of LKI's journey uh, since 2015. Uh, the story begins with the vision of the late Minister Kadri Gama for LKI to become a Chatham House for this region, which helps to decipher global developments for Sri Lanka and which offers research and insights to strengthen Sri Lanka's place in the world. LKI made its first entry into the University of Pennsylvania's index of top foreign policy think tanks last year, and again this year, and we hope to build on that reputation with the late minister's vi vision in mind. We knew we could only achieve this, this difficult task with the best experts and international partnerships possible. The best experts for LKI began with members of the board of management who have been tremendously modern and relevant guides. They had the foresight to institute a global economy program to reflect the growing importance of economic diplomacy alongside a traditional global governance program on strategic diplomacy. And importantly, it was they who grounded LKI with a larger purpose by explicitly adopting into LKI's mission the pursuit of values, namely peace, justice, prosperity, and sustainability. On the critical issue of how we were going to fund this new global economy program in a way that could attract the best resident experts, two knights in shining armor roared into our midst. The Honorable Harsha de Silva, as he often does, bounded in to come up with the necessary and complete solution. And the team from Dilma, led by Mr. Malik Fernando, with great patience and Dilma's incredible generosity, provided the solution via a three-year commitment to fund a chair of the Global Economy Program. As to how we sought this gem of a chair who will be addressing you today, I have the assiduous team at LKI to thank. They look for opportunities for this institute and for this country at every turn. Not being an economist myself, I came to know of Ganesh's work through our then tiny research team who said to me, you know, you should really look at this person's work. And it was through the team's similarly detective work that we also just gained the first research fellow of the Global Economy Program. Adam Collins, who arrived only just yesterday from ODI, a leading think tank in London. Lastly, of course, the story ends, and in a way begins, with Ganesh, who took a chance on LKI by coming here and honored the vision, the people, the supporters of this institute by becoming the inaugural chair. You have his bio in his folders, so I won't take time by reading that, but I'll just mention a few facts. Ganesh completed his first degree in economics at LSC, where he learned international relations from one of our board members, Dr. Saravan Muthu, and his doctorate in economics from the University of Oxford. He's later worked in leading private sector and international organizations, including at the Commonwealth Secretariat with Dr. Indrajit Kumar Sami. He's the author of 18 books, some of which he'll draw upon in today's lecture, and worked for the ADB from 2004 to 2017, including as advisor in the office of the chief economist in Manila. He has spoken all around the world and indeed delivered 
previous incarnations of today's lecture at the French Prime Minister's office in Paris, at Chatham House in London, as well as in Washington, New Delhi, and Tokyo. Since arriving at LKI in July 2017, he has spoken and written for a wide audience, and importantly for LKI, has invested enormously in staff development. I asked colleagues to describe Ganesh in one to two words, and at the risk of making him blush, here's a sampling of the words they used. Energetic, witty, upbeat, spontaneous, avuncular, caring, optimistic, engaged, a spark, knowledgeable, intellectually passionate, and elegant. Before I embarrass him away out of the institute, I had better get this started. Uh, if I could just take a moment to remind you to switch your mobile phones onto silent mode. Uh, I won't introduce everyone at length, except to say that it's a rare honor to have these speakers here individually and together. We're thrilled to have Dr. Kumar Sami, Governor of the Central Bank, and a distinguished economist in his own right, Dr. Harsha De Silva, Deputy Minister of National Policies and Economic Affairs, and a key figure in reorienting our foreign policy towards economic diplomacy. Dr. Sarala Fernando, a distinguished former ambassador of Sri Lanka, who served as our permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva, and was also fittingly the founding director of this institute. And Mr. James Crabtree, contributing editor to the Financial Times and senior research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School at the National University of Singapore. Ganesh, I have the pleasure now of inviting you to the podium. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I should start by thanking a number of people. First, I should thank Dinusha and the LKI staff who have been tremendous in welcoming me here and organizing this amazing event. Second, I should thank Dilma and Dilan Fernando for his generosity. And then I must thank our panelists for sacrificing their afternoon, uh, Indrajit, Sarala, Harsha, and James. Uh, thank you so much. Today, this is a really serious and interesting topic. Um, it's on a recovering world economy, and I want to tell you that after years of tepid growth, the IMF World Economic Outlook 2017, October, predicts a recovering world economy. Um, we're thinking of 3.7% growth um, for the world economy, now, Asia's giants, China and India, are growing at more than double that figure. And that's much faster than the advanced countries. And naturally, that's led to a very lively debate on what are the export-led strategies of these countries going to do in the future, and what kinds of reforms are likely to be there. And there are some interesting studies on this, but most of these studies predate the global financial crisis of 2008. So it kind of makes sense to take a look at some of the new issues in this new environment. And to do this, there are probably four questions I think we probably are all interested in. The first is, what exactly is their performance in terms of growth? Second, what role did economic reforms play in this performance versus, say, initial conditions? Third, can India actually emulate China ever? And fourth, what's the outlook, both in the next two to three years and say to 2030. So this is the kind of material I'm going to try to cover today. I'm going to try to do it fairly fast and in a non-technical manner. You have a write-up in case you want it. And in case you're still interested and still interested in this topic further, there are a couple of things that you can look at. There is a, a book um, that the East-West Center published, which has the policy detail um, of what the giants did in terms of their reforms and also their performance, and a lot on their FDA strategy. And second, there is the last report I put to bed at the ADB, uh, which is on ASEAN, China, and India, the Great Transformation, which has the forecast to 2030, and some of the issues around energy and water and 
uh, global financial cooperation issues of that type. So if you're still interested, you can look at those. And if you're still interested in even more, I'll give you more material. Um, so so I, I've become obsessed with the giants because there's so much uh, a part of our lives now and in the future. So let's start with comparing the giants growth. So we have a story like this, don't we? This gentleman is exiting the scene, uh, sadly. And with that, possibly the elephant in the room may not be present in global governance or in the world economy. So these people and that person and India have to take the lead. So the question is, what is exactly is the performance? And I'm going to try to offer you five stylized facts. Growth, I'm going to talk about poverty reduction, I'll talk a bit about trade, and I'm going to give you some comparisons with advanced countries, and we shall see where that economy is in terms of the giants. And I think that's the fun part of this story. The first is a simple chart that gives you GDP growth over 20 years, 1980 to 2018. Um, we have the world in blue, red for China, of course, and green for India. And we have another chart which is shares of world GDP, and you have the same colors, and this is 1980 to 2018. And what you see is that China in particular grew at a historically unprecedented rate of 10% per year for practically three decades. Um, and that is not surpassed by any major economy in history, as far as we can tell. Yeah? India grows at 6% um, per year, which is fairly respectable. And the world grows at some 3.5%. Then we have this global financial crisis where everybody dips, but China not so much. And then we come to the most recent phase, and here you see the IMF numbers. Um, they're saying the world is recovering, and you see 3.6, 3.7, 3.7. So with the margin of error, we are probably just about at a standstill. Um, um, so it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious about the recovery concept. I guess the US is coming out, and the expectation is that things will be much better. What is also interesting here is China is slowing 6 or 7% compared to the 10, and India is forecast to accelerate. Now, this is a projection, right? So we are seeing a change in the dynamic between the two giants, and that's very interesting going forward. What is very dramatic is when you look at the shares. So China accounts for 2.3% of the world economy in 1980 and 20% 20 in 2018. And then India goes from 2.9, same base, to 8. And then the really big shifts are the US that actually declines and Japan that declines and the rest of the world declines. So we are beginning to see the Asian century, I guess, in, in real numbers. And this is next year. Now, the other big achievement is, is this mind-boggling fall in poverty. There are two ways of looking at poverty. One is at $1.25. The other is at $1.90. This is the more modern method of looking at it. And when you add these two together, between them, India and China took 800 million people out of poverty since 1993. 800 million people. Okay? It's a kind of a mind-boggling number when you think of our population in this country. And they did that through trade-led growth. So the third stylized fact is the share of uh, merchandise trade globally. And what you see here is this really quite remarkable trade-led growth strategy of the giants. And what is particularly striking is by the mid-2000s, China overtakes the United States as the world's largest trader. So that's 10 years ago. Okay, and that's part of the reason why you have a lot of um, discussion about uh, non-tariff measures and, and, and uh, protectionism that, that has begun to arise. The United States is 9%, Japan is 4 India is about 2 um, So that's the story on trade-led growth. Now that trade has got very sophisticated. It's no longer trade that gets made in one country in totality and then shipped out of that country. It's trade that gets made in parts and components from different countries and assembled in some final place. Um, and it's geographically distributed trade, which is about half of global trade today. And what is very striking is China is the major, major producer of this, along with European Union. 
United States is less important in this trade. Um, Japan is less important, but the Japanese number is a little um, understated because the Japan is very prominent in ASEAN countries. Um, and India is about 1% of this trade. So, so this trade um, is very sophisticated form of organization. And China's impressive rise in this is due to large productivity of their workers, but also massive factories that they have that produce scale economies um, which are unbelievable, 10,000 worker factories. Now, just to give you a picture of what this means, most people think this iPhone is made in the US. Not true. It's actually made in the world um, and assembled in China. So here's Apple, and the product is designed in California, and there are some 200 odd suppliers around the world that make bits and bobs, and it's all put together in a factory in Shenzhen um, by a Taiwanese uh, player, Foxconn. Okay? So that's the iPhone, and that's increasingly the way that trade is going to go, and China's achievement is becoming basically the global's factory of putting this stuff together. The, the price quality delivery of China is, is something unsurpassed uh, again in recent history. Now, India is important, um, and it has been particularly important in services, and you see it in ICT. India accounts for some 11% of global ICT trade, um, and it surpasses China, and there is some Indian production in services trade. Now, this is partly due to ample supplies of highly educated IIT and IIM graduates who are very good. Um, they also have English language as a, as a very important uh, factor in there. And they have overseas non-resident Indians who have worked in Silicon Valley who like to go back, and also in the IT sector, and that's been very important in the end case. And their communications costs have fallen down a lot. So that is a major reason why India is in the IT sector. But China, as you see, is a major exporter of services. So that's the story in terms of stylus facts. India and China now are dominating world GDP as well as world trade. And so, so how did it happen? Um, what's the role of initial conditions and what's the role of reforms? And one is led by this Time magazine cover. Um, there's lots of interest in why this has happened. And let me try to tell you um, a simple story. Various theories are there. And people talk about um, geography as being terribly important. And part of the geography is that Japan was in East Asia as the only developed country. And after the 1985 Plaza Accord, where Japan's currency began to appreciate, um, Japanese outward investment started looking for out locations, and China was one of the big ones. Yeah? And China had liberalized by this point. So that's one explanation. India had ties with. Europe, partly because of British rule, um, but not linked in the same way that Japan as a manufacturing center was. Another one is the domestic market side. The Chinese market is huge, uh, particularly today, but it was always important. Then there is low-cost labor. Chinese labor, according to studies of productivity, works three shifts, uh, seven days a week, and there's a queue of people at the factory gate willing to take the job of the person in the factory. And that's what it's traditionally been until fairly recently where there has been a labor shortage. Uh, very few countries can do that. Um, and part of that productivity also comes from investments made by the communist regime before the opening up in health and education. So China's literacy and health levels were very high prior to opening up at a level that was very different to that of India. Um, then there's this issue of institutions, and two which are quite fun, the Communist Party, and there's a big debate about authoritarian states versus democratic regimes. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party had um, a set of discipline that is very different to um, any other form of government, and they most importantly had a long-term vision, and they typically implemented reforms faster than others. Um, and that's one interesting factor. The other that's talked about a lot in the literature, particularly sociology and other types, and I'm, I'm an economist, so I don't really understand that literature, is about Confucianist values. And that goes that um, they have a strong collective culture in China that comes from order, respect, hierarchy, and harmony. And these things make a difference when you're trying to do manufacturing, particularly complex manufacturing. And, and so these theories are there. And, my gut as an economist was this was terribly important in determining uh, China and India's um, initial conditions. But of course, a lot of it is, is also due to their reforms. Um, and this is what they looked like in the 1950s to the 70s. And 
China's achievement is stunning. They, they got rid of the private sector pretty much in 1950s uh, during the Great Leap Forward. Um, and, and that's really quite a dramatic thing. And what they had was basically 150,000 very small firms of five workers or less. Uh, and then they had lots of state-owned enterprises. And so they were inward-oriented. India was very similar. Um, and there's this famous Hindu rate of growth. So for 25 years or so, these countries stagnated. And the reforms were then the episode. And the Chinese storyline um, is a fascinating one. Um, they emphasized market socialism with Chinese characteristics. And by that, they meant a strong state role while gradually controlled opening to the private sector a very different model to what the Indians have approached or anyone else has approached. Japan did some of this, Korea did some of this, but the Chinese one was particularly interesting. So on the market-led side, they opened the door to foreign investment, but they didn't go for 100% ownership. They went for joint ventures, plus they set up these special economic zones, um, and they had a very strong role for the state, which continued to be very important in their resource allocation. Central planning is still important even today. They have five-year plans where they allocate resources sectorally and intersectorally. Uh, they have a staggering array of state-owned enterprise across all sectors, in employing millions of workers. And much more controversially, they use industrial policy. That is a mixture of subsidies, finance, local content rules, and what may be called forced technology transfer to get foreign firms to transfer their technology to Chinese companies. Uh, some people call that stealing or theft of intellectual property. Um, and they've done that to foster globally competitive firms. Um, now, that approach has had a mixed record. There have been some spectacular successes, such as the high-speed train, uh, as well as the C-919 commercial jet. That's a 150-seater medium-bodied medium jet, alongside some very spectacular failures, uh, such as the homegrown 3G mobile technology. Um, the other very important thing was that they cut a lot of their protection uh, during the time that they joined the WTO. India was also a liberalizer, but in a more gradual manner, and perhaps in a slightly more haphazard manner um, in terms of their reforms, um, and there are still a lot of protections. The, the 1991 reforms of Narasimha Rao and, and Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, who later became Prime Minister, were very noteworthy in what they tried to do. Um, but subsequent reforms uh, were also one step back, although the Modi government is trying some important initiatives, and I'm going to show you some data on that. The big success and the big difference of this, of course, is in foreign direct investment. So China gets $158 billion a year in the period 2000 to 2016, $158 billion per year, okay? And that was up from some 19 billion. Um, India gets some 23 billion, and if you compare the second decade of Indian reforms with the first decade of China, you kind of get a magnitude that India will gradually get more and more FDI as time goes on. The other aspect of this is the outward investment. China now with wages rising and costs rising and it's becoming an expensive place to produce, is now exporting a lot of its capital and European and other firms are also going out. Rising wages are one factor, but China has also eased restrictions on foreign direct investment outward. And a lot of this is going to Southeast Asia and India. So there's this interesting India-China link that's happening. US, of course, is the recipient as well as the European Union. The Indian number is, I think, understated uh, because we're not capturing um, the investment that Indian companies based in Singapore and Dubai are making uh, to the rest of the world. And also, we're not capturing the IT investment, which is India's big competitive advantage, in the rest of the region. So there are some 200 Indian IT companies in China, and that doesn't show up in the data. Yeah? So that's a very interesting uh, issue. And China has become a major outward investor since the global financial crisis. Now, China and India appear to be outward-oriented models, and they are. And you see this in the tariff data, where average tariffs on agriculture down to 3% in China, 7 in India, manufacturing tariffs. But there are lots and lots of non-tariff measures. And you see this in services, where China and India have lots of service restrictions. FDI, regulatory restrictiveness, on the OECD, shows lots of restrictions. There are phytosanitary standards, 
China and India are famous for anti-dumping use at the WTO and so on. So these are still quite closed economies, but growing incredibly fast and dominating the world economy with a very careful controlled liberalization. Um, very interesting. The exchange rate, um, over time they have tried to keep competitive exchange rates and ensure that the price of capital was controlled um, in a particular manner, although more recently they have liberalized both. And you see the appreciation here of rates, uh, the exchange rate, and you see gradually the interest rates are also picking up. But over a long period of time, they ensured that the prices were kept in a way that favored state-owned enterprise and large business houses in the case of India. So when we compare the reforms, um, neither of them did the big bang a la Russia which caused misery uh, for the rest of the population in the Soviet Union, they both had a gradual approach over 40, 50 years. Okay? So that's the first thing that you pick up really clearly. The second thing is that they use foreign investment and in a very strategic sense, but they differ a lot. China introduced reforms uh, much earlier than India. It was swifter and much more coordinated for its reform. Um, it used much more comprehensive set of tools for attracting export-oriented FDI, particularly at the level of the state, uh, the Chinese provinces were, were famous for this. Um, they got into EPZs much earlier, et cetera, et cetera. And they used industrial policy um, as a very clear instrument to build up uh, giant domestic firms, both state and domestic firms, and they're planning to do this in a new generation of uh, technologies. India was much more cautious, but that has changed with the Modi government because he has this Make in India campaign which I think will become the new industrial policy for India and will deepen more and more uh, as India seeks to get its manufacturing success together. Now here are the two men, okay? I hope everybody recognizes them and knows which one is which. Um, so he is 64, uh, he is 67, all right? And um, he's a chemical engineer and He's a political scientist with a master's uh, in political science from Gujarat University. Um, she went to Tsinghua University. And for those of you who likes astrology, uh, one is a Gemini, the other is a Virgo. <laughs> okay, so, so, so much for that. Um, these are really uh, men with very ambitious visions for their country, um, countries. And um, you can see them um, in their prime, as it were, in this wonderful photograph. Um, he's smiling because he's leading the world economy and he's wondering how he might do it. Um, so so here, here's what, what they are. So they both came to power about the same time, right? That's what's so fascinating in this era where we are. Um, she, November 2012, and he wants a mixed economy but with socialist characteristics, and that's a big difference between the two of them. Um, and there's a very strong state role. State will reform and so on, and SOEs will reform, but there's a strong state role. Um, Modi um, is talking about radical reforms. Um, now, let me try to give you a sense of some of the depth of their reforms. So, she's, one of his big achievements uh, was he ended the wine, one child policy in 2016. Um, so now Chinese can have two kids, right? And that's really important uh, because it counters the low fertility rates and deals with the aging problem. Right, which is one of the things that is uh, affecting East Asian countries, particularly China. The second thing that he's done is a strong anti-corruption drive. One of the things that you got in the industrial policy in the SOEs was a lot of corruption amongst uh, officials. Um, and from what I read, um, some 1,500 officials have been um, investigated in China over the period of Xi's uh, uh, presidency, and 150 of these have been at the level of vice minister or vice governor. So he has done a major crackdown on corruption. He's also tried to make the RMB along the route of being a reserve currency um, and internationalizing it. Um, and of course, there's the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is an enormous uh, uh, initiative, which I'll talk about in a second. And then he plans a lot more reform gradually. Now, Modi has been radical in, in many ways. Um, the, the nationwide uh, goods and service tax consolidated a number of tax across different states into a national GST, goods and services tax, which, which basically uh, is the biggest tax reform since 1947, as I can, I can say it in India. Um, and it reduces costs for the private sector and it streamlines the economy. The other uh, one that uh, people have mixed views is the demonetization. Um, 
basically overnight he got rid of 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes, um, and it was to do with the black money economy in India, which is some people say is about as half as the white money economy. Um, so really quite detailed reforms. And then the other thing Modi did, which was impressive, was he created 9 million bank accounts for the poor, something like that, within a very short period, as part of a way of trying to get the poor to participate in economic development. He put money into every bank account and so on. And again, successes and failures. Then what is so interesting is this, right? And you see these two economies, by the standards of the elephant in the room, as being internationalist, right? Um, they are supporting regional trade liberalization through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is Asia's mega trade agreement. They've established two major development banks. Uh, they're talking about developing countries having a greater voice in the IMF, and they both support climate change, along with the European Union. So we have this really kind of paradoxical situation where the elephant in the room is no longer playing, and Asian giants are leading global governance. It's, it's fascinating. One could have never predicted this historically. Now, here's another big question. Um, can the elephant catch up with the dragon or emulate? And um, in terms of this story, um, we talked a bit about foreign investment, uh, which is there. Um, but let me try to give you a sense of some of the other arguments that people talk about. One is the demographics. India has a very youthful population under the age of 24. Uh, there are some uh, 20 million Indians of, of that age group who've been added to the population uh, between here and there, whereas China's number has gone down by 80 million. Okay, fertility rate is one problem, aging is another. Um, now that's really good for Indian growth, particularly as they're thinking to get into the high skill industries, but the gap is that skill levels are a problem. So China's tertiary enrollment rate is 43% of the age group, India's is only some 27%. And China has 4.6 million people in what they call the STEM subjects, which is science, technology, engineering, maths, and so on. India only has 2.7 million. So India has a lot of people of the youth age group, but the education levels vary quite a lot, and that's a barrier. A second issue is technology gaps. Um, these are R&D and GDP figures. China spends 2.1% of its G GDP on R&D, close to levels in developed countries, Japan and the US. India's R&D spending appears to have stagnated. And that's a problem, and China is increasingly focusing on the modern industries of robotics, AI, biotech, um, and so on, which are the industries of the future. Infrastructure is another interesting area. There's a McKinsey study here that talks about China having invested 8.6% of its GDP annually in this period on, on infrastructure. India spends about five, and that number has gone up a lot during Modi's time. There is the United States. India has put a lot of it into ports, um, which, which is visible there in terms of uh, the port development. And they're talking about the Saga Mala port development program, which is trying to revolutionize 12 new ports and they're going to spend millions on this program. Um, and this is expected to increase Indian port capacity by 30 million tons annually, um, with 12 new uh, ports or upgraded ports across the region. And that will make a huge difference to India's wanting to be the hub uh, in this region, competing with other centers uh, that are also trying to do this. India lags in the railways, which are critical for manufacturing, and electric supply is a challenge. A third area which is really interesting in this is the BRI, and a lot of you know about this, so I won't spend much time. Um, I looked at some data recently. This is an initiative on the scale of the Marshall Plan after World War II, uh, which the US launched to rebuild Europe. Um, I think the figure in real terms today of the Marshall Plan spending is something like $123 billion. This is if you take the number then and you multiply it by the inflation factor, you get that number. China's pledges, at least the numbers we could find, are that. Okay, so double that of the Marshall Plan um, in today's prices. So this is just mind-bogglingly interesting in terms of an initiative. Um, lots of risks, um, as small open countries like uh, SL know about. Um, risks vary like this. So it's still a work in progress, and you, you come to this conclusion that recipients should prioritize BRI project needs and negotiate well 
Um, a recent discussion we had in, in this institution talked about various interest rates that Sri Lanka was going to face from BRI projects. And it's fascinating what these terms are then. Um, so only time will tell if the BRI is going to benefit the world economy, but certainly it's an, it's, it's an indication of the scale of ambition of China, bigger than the Marshall Plan in terms of numbers. India's business regulations are an interesting issue. Um, and, and, and what's staggering is that on the World Bank's doing business indicators, China comes at 78th and India is 130. Um, so neither of them have a particularly good business environment, which is kind of interesting if you think about their rates of growth. Now, small countries can't do this. Uh, I mean, big countries, uh, investors will come, markets uh, will be there with big firms. Um, but, but it's fascinating. And um, India does better than China in terms of getting credit, but starting a business, China does better. And, and enforcing a contract, terribly important. China does really well on this, fifth in the world, according to these numbers. Okay, what, what can we think of the future? Now, forecasting um, is really an art rather than a science. Um, we're really trying to predict human behavior, um, and it's really hard to do, right? So you're led to John Kenneth Galbraith, the Canadian economist who said, you know, forecasting is like astrology, but it's what economists pretend to do. Um, as I think I'm an economist, I should pretend to forecast. So I'm gonna to try to do two kinds of forecasts. One is give you what the IMF economist's best guess is of what's gonna to happen to China and India in the next three years. And then I'm going to give you a bigger number with kind of structural indicators um, of GDP to tell you what, through a model, to tell you what the world might look like in 2030 if the right kind of policies are followed, yeah? In China and India. So the first one um, is what I've sort of mentioned before. Um, a soft landing in China is predicted. People have been talking about a hard landing where China suddenly collapses or there's some kind of big internal conflict. That hasn't happened and one doesn't expect it to happen. China has enormous reserves. Um, it expects the BRI program to be a big success. It has the Chinese Communist Party, which is able to keep the structures together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But India is projected to grow faster. Now, I, I put a footnote there that at current 2017, the IMF number for India is 6.5. So this is the wish, if certain things will occur, India will grow faster, of IMF economies, yeah? But many risks. Um, particularly that, uh, we don't know the direction of that. Um, now, longer term, there's a whole host of challenges the giants face. So if you're interested, you might go and look at this big uh, ADB, ADBI study. Um, but the environment is a big issue in China, if everybody knows. Social exclusion is a big problem in India, as well as the environment, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Lots and lots of big challenges. Many solutions um, that one can think about. China clearly has to prepare for aging. That's going to be a factor as the silver-haired generation follows that of Korea and Japan and so on, and there's going to be less population. So in a way, India and China getting together is great. One has a youthful population, the other has an aging population. If one can find the synergies, that will be amazing. Um, and thing for India is about connecting the rural sector with the urban sector. Um, very, very important. Energy. Uh, dependence on reducing dependence on coal and green industries. China is going to invest a lot of money in this in the future. Um, for India, the fiscal deficits are a big issue as well as the underserved individuals. Um, so lots of things each are trying to do. Um, now, here is the forecast from our ADB, ADBI study um, that talks about an optimistic scenario. This is based on a big model and it tells you that China will go from 14% of the world economy to some 24% uh, by 2030. So it will continue to be the biggest country in GDP. Um, India will go to 11%, uh, doubling, um, bigger increase than China in terms of its own proportion. Um, the United States um, will be less important, 19% today or then to 13%, Europe goes from 21 to 13, Japan, et cetera. Um, so that's the prediction. This is the best guess using a model, um, the best technology we have to try to look at long-term predictions. And these numbers are somewhat similar to the McKinsey study, the Goldman Sachs study, and others of the individual countries. Um, so they are fascinating when you think about the implications. Now the implications of this, if all the reforms that Modi talks about, 
uh, she talks about and more are done, you get these kind of mind-boggling numbers. I mean, look at this. One, two billion people will join this middle class. $26,000 per head in China, 11,000 in India, and, and so on. Mind-boggling changes that we're going to see in the next decade or so. It's in our lifetime. So, what can we say? Um, India and China are going to swap places um, in the near term. Further afield, uh, they will continue to expand if they um, do the sorts of reforms that they're talking about and more. Um, how each will come out, for India it's about the BRI, sorry, for China it's about the BRI, uh, to neatly transit to a position of global leadership and also reforming its state-owned enterprises. Those will be important challenges. For India, it's about the supply side, skills, technology, infrastructure, uh, in addition to attracting FDI. And both will need to do reforms to get the private sector. And if you still want to know more, um, you can look at all of these papers. <laughs> and if you still want more, you can look at all these short pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ganeshan, for a compelling and uh, insightful presentation. Having known Ganeshan for a long time, uh, it's not in the least bit surprising uh, to listen to the, to the depth and uh, breadth of the analysis uh, and also the, the excellent presentational skills. Um, as a package, it's been very compelling, as I said. Um, now we're going to get to the next phase of this event, which is to have our distinguished panelists to speak. Um, if I've understood my role correctly, uh, Ganeshan has given us uh, a tremendous analysis of what has happened and what is happening and what is likely to happen uh, in India and China. But the primary role of the panelists is to try to tease out what the implications are for Sri Lanka. Uh, so that's what we're going to do next. And let me start by uh, asking the Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Dr. Harsha De Silva, uh, to make his remarks. I'm not going to introduce them because Dinush has already done that, so in the interest of time, let me, let me invite uh, the Deputy Minister to speak. I, I mean, for us, I don't consider Sri Lanka necessarily a South Asian country. I consider Sri Lanka as an Indian Ocean country. So if you look at Sri Lanka as an Indian Ocean country, it becomes very important how we balance China and India. Essentially, that is our challenge. Uh, how do we work with both giants and in the process benefit? Uh, how do we bring our people's uh, living standards better? How can we create wealth in Sri Lanka? How can we create jobs? Um, that is our... Uh, uh, opportunity. So we need to leverage um, Sri Lanka, however much we talk about Sagar Mala, $100 billion uh, dollar project, 150 you know, odd uh, uh, ports projects. Sri Lanka has uh, you know, some of the best ports in the region. We have now three ports, deep sea ports. Um, and how uh, we can plug ourselves to the global production networks that Ganesh was talking about. Um, and in that context, how do we build bridges with the rest of the world? Uh, what we did, our government did, was to repair the bridges that were either damaged or broken. Uh, I mean, a good example is GSP Plus uh, from a non-engagement government, we completely took a different position and became an engaging uh, party. And we went to Geneva. Uh, we, we spoke with the international community. Um, actually, you know, going back to Geneva in two weeks time, continuing the engagement. Um, and that helped us uh, re-establish our, our sort of credentials, our credibility. As a, as a respected country in the world. So by doing that, I envision you know, what we are doing as building these bridges, uh, if you may, uh, 
Um, and those bridges will, will do two things. One, bring investment dollars, and two, take out goods and services from here. So the key is to leverage the opportunity we have as really the, the center of the Indian Ocean. Uh, leverage our relationships with China and India and the rest of the world and see how we can balance these two forces uh, and do it in a way that is most beneficial to us. We have to be selfish of our own interest. That's what comes first. So in doing that, obviously, we have multiple questions that are being asked. And, and how, do we, how do we genuinely deal with those fears? Uh, how do we ensure that uh, China doesn't use our ports as a military or military bases? Or how, how do we make sure that if Chinese subs show up uh, in our ports, uh, that it happens in a way that is acceptable to the global regional community? Uh, or else, how do we make sure that our friends are able to utilize our ports for both commercial and, and, and sort of r and others for, for, for military purposes? As you know, we had the USS uh, Nimitz, the world's largest or some aircraft carrier dock here. We saw uh, uh, in Hambantota uh, the Japanese, Indians, and the Americans together uh, in our ports in, in Hambantota. Um, so so it, it's, it's, it's a challenge for us, but I think that's also the opportunity for us. So our free trade agreements with India, our free trade agreements with China, our GSP Plus, and hopefully doing more with, 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 uh, with, the, uh, with the European Union. Uh, Commonwealth, we're talking with the, the, the UK on, on perhaps using uh, our relationship with the UK and expanding the Commonwealth into something more than just politics. Maybe Commonwealth trade, uh, some sort of uh, agreement, you know, our, our, our leverage in the US. So, so to me, uh, this is all very good because the wealth is going to be created uh, in this part of the world, the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and to have some sort of um, um, uh, control uh, in, in, or not control, some influence in the commerce and wealth that is getting created in the Indian Ocean is going to be our key to, key to our success. So to end, and that is why we are taking um, um, some steps. We are actually, uh, even though we are a small country, we want to punch above our weight class in this, in this uh, exercise. And that's why we are saying, look, we'll take the lead uh, to explore the possibilities of looking at some sort of rules-based order uh, in the Indian Ocean so that no one is denied access and everybody's cargo, everybody's commercial uh, 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 transactions are safe uh, and are done uh, at the lowest possible cost. So to, to us, um, what's happening around us is, 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 uh, is certainly going to be most beneficial. And our objective is to, to, to create that knowledge-based, highly competitive social market economy at the center of the Indian Ocean. So that's how I see it, Th Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister. As you all know, the Deputy Minister has, was very central in, in repositioning our diplomacy uh, to give much greater uh, priority to, to uh, commercial diplomacy. And, and clearly, uh, you've heard him articulate the vision for the country, which uh, would depend, and the success of that vision would depend on having very effective uh, commercial diplomacy. Let me next turn to Ambassador Dr. Sadra De Silva. Thank you. I hope you can hear me at the back. Yes. Um, thank you, Dean Nusha, and thank you, Dean Kiai, for inviting me to speak today. It's very good to have an eminent economist here and that you have a global economy program now. It's the kind of thing that Foreign Minister Khadir Dama, when he set up the LKI, was very interested in. <coughs> And also because globalization and the speed of communication of information makes 
economists and diplomats no longer just able to report on current developments. They've got to be able to forecast and predict what's going to happen. Now, Minister Kadirgama was very interested in having the discussions, issues, ideas coming up in LKR. It was then called the Sri Lanka Institute of International Relations, brought forward into the policy making arena. For instance, as soon as he came in, he asked a panel within the OPI, OPA, to set out an Asian foreign policy. And he even asked young officers in the foreign ministry to come up with uh, fresh ideas, out of the box ideas, which could be taken up as policy initiatives. One of those was a very young officer who produced a paper on Buddhist diplomacy. And this actually was the basis on which this uh, resolution to make Vesak a UN holiday, um, that was the way it went up. But uh, you might wonder what is the value of this, but it did actually give us a nice group, like-minded countries, which gave Sri Lanka a lot of support and made our visibility in the international arena. At a time when uh, we were having this conflict in Sri Lanka, so it was uh, very useful. And in public diplomacy, I think uh, there is a saying borrowed from Did Maro, says it's better to be at the takeoff point rather than at the crash landing. So I think, uh, Minister, you are now dealing with SITEM at the crash landing site. <laughs> <laughs> Much easier if uh, there would have been some kind of uh, uh, national consensus on all of this when all of this when it began. <coughs> I should also say that my remarks today are conditioned by my both my career in diplomacy and international relations, and also now my retirement interest, which is on heritage issues. So this duality produces really very interesting results. For instance, in the strategic community, they are asking questions that Mukaja uh, has, has um, addressed today on the rise of India and China, future relationships and so on, consensual or conflicting. Among the strategists, they speak of China's military defense expenditure, they speak of merchant shipping, which is increasing at a rate, they speak of the South China Seas, and there is a sense in the strategic community that this is going to lead to some inevitable conflict. However, if you look at heritage and history, one could see exactly the opposite up to about the 15th century here in the Indian Ocean, India and China are going peaceful coexistence within a very prosperous Asia. Civilizational assets were being peacefully exchanged between the two sides and common understanding existed in the Indian Ocean area on free trade and navigation. So uh, with my apologies to our Western colleagues who may be here, it was only when the Western powers came into the Indian Ocean with new weaponry and ideas of colonization that this peace and the Swarna Bhumi of the time uh, really was disturbed. So if you ask me which scenario would prevail, uh, I would think it would be the peaceful coexistence because on both China and India have learned to work together for many centuries. And I think this is what will prevail. But there is a caveat, and that is the fourth generation of weapons which are unpredictable. Uh, robots, AI, uh, drones, <coughs> cyber attacks. It is very difficult to trace where these come from, and it's quite possible that this could spark some sort of conflict between the two. So I would like to add something more. Um, I think Ganesh touched on this, and that is the forecasting diplomacy is or economics is very difficult because of the possibility of shocks to the system. When I was in Bangkok, I remember the, the president of Indonesia was asked to come and receive a medal because of the wonderful results they had on poverty alleviation. Within a couple of weeks came the Asian, the first Asian financial crisis. All these gains were wiped out, just like that. See what is happening today in Puerto Rico. I mean, Puerto Rico was like a shining star. So much of electrical lights and bulbs and activities. When this last hurricane hit, for two days, no one could communicate 
with people inside Puerto Rico. All the telecom towers were down. They had no food even two weeks after the crisis. <coughs> everything was flown in and with no refrigeration, food could not be kept, distributed. So uh, my Puerto Rican friends here are saying this might lead to some kind of real change in the way business is conducted in Puerto Rico. Certainly they will be much more emphasis on growing their own food and so on. So now Caribbean islands are used to coping with hurricanes, but it seems these hurricanes are now intensifying in a manner and coming more frequently than they ever expected. So climate change is inevitable, but how are we preparing for it? Now in diplomacy, we look for shifts, new movements coming from us. And my own sense is that these global man-made and natural disasters which are brought to our notice every day on the television, the radio, and so on, are creating a general sense of general unease in the public. As technology moves forward in unstoppable ways, I think we are going to see a questioning of globalization, which even in the Western countries has started now with the Trump phenomenon and Brexit. I think the tipping point will come over the freedom of movement. And here, I feel whether some of this unease is also spilling over into the <coughs> public uh, demonstrations we have over Saitam and Etka, the feeling that local jobs must be protected <coughs> at all costs, even though obviously there is an element of opposition politics also involved. So one, one way would be for the government to provide much more assurance to the public of stricter control over job visas, which are inevitable, and perhaps the current abuse of tourist visas for work. They need to be able to talk to the people in this sense, to be at the front end rather than at the crash landing. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. International lending agencies have contingency plans for disaster assistance, and there's a huge human response globally. I was in Geneva after the tsunami, and I saw for myself this, what is called the chain de Bonha, it's a telethon which raises funds very quickly from the public in times of natural disaster. The money is transferred to the Swiss relief organization and they on lend to programs like uh, um, cash for housing and so on. So time is up. Let me just end with this question. Are the old growth models, have they got to change? Can we continue with infrastructure-led growth? It is under severe scrutiny here. And let us look for win-win responses. The Chinese economic zone coming up in Humbat Hotel run into controversy because they apparently asked for some 400 elephants to be chased over. Yet there's a plan waiting for an elephant sanctuary in this adjoining area developed by wildlife people like Sumit Pilapitiya. In manner of which, um, can you give me a minute more? Yeah, sure. <laughs> in manner where I'm just finishing a new coffee table book, there is a proposal for CEB to build a huge wind farm on Mana Island, and the distribution lines will run through one of the best bird sanctuaries called Wankarai. Can we not do something? And here, of course, is where I'm saying to Dinusha, bring all of these issues, whatever you have here, whatever comes up here, to the policymakers and see if you can um, work something better than we've had so far. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I mean, I think that brings across very vividly that the complexity and diversity of challenges uh, policymaking in today's world uh, entails. James, may I ask you to make your remarks now? Thank you. Um, so, great privilege to be here. Um, I used to cover Sri Lanka for the FT. When I spent five years in India as the Mumbai bureau chief for the FT, and I used to shuttle down here um, once a quarter to, to as my sort of rest cure from India. Um, I've now moved to Singapore. I don't get to do it as often, but thank you very much to Nusha for having me and thank you to Ganesh both for the presentation and for starting this program. Um, let me say three things to try and build on what Ganesh gave us as the base, the economic base, and try and talk a little bit about the politics of this and, and what it might mean for smaller Asian countries like Sri Lanka. I mean, it seems to me there isn't really much dispute anymore about the, 
economic scenarios that Ganesh has um, painted. There was a time relatively recently in which you'd find people doubting um, the trajectory of the two big Asian powers, ASEAN, if you include that. I, I think there's now an acceptance that the, the scenarios that Ganesh has painted are what is going to happen. The question is what then happens to politics. Um, to some degree, a shakeup in regional order in Asia was inevitable. It wasn't, I think, anticipated that this would be accelerated by um, Brexit in my own country and the distraction that's meant from the European Union and what's happened with Mr. Trump. Almost everything that we now talk about is colored by the uncertainty about what exactly America's policies in this part of the world are. Uh, in theory, Mr. Trump next month at the APEC summit is going to give a magisterial speech in which he outlines uh, definitively what America's Asia policy has now become. But I, I, I suspect um, we will nonetheless after that uh, still be in a situation of some uncertainty. Um, it's in that context in which um, the mood music around uh, Mr. Xi's speech uh, last week or the week before last, whenever it was, um, his three and a half hour epic where he talked about China standing tall in Asia um, and, and the sort of undeniable sense that in the second term China is going to begin to prod more carefully um, at the existing order in this part of the world and although not try and overturn it to begin to um, amend, augment different elements of it in its own interest. And if you take an even further step back, you now have four powerful political leaders around Eurasia um, in Putin, Abe, Modi, and Xi, who want to change significant parts of the, the current um, setup. So that, that's the one, po one point that, that countries like Sri Lanka have to now begin to cope with um, a sort of era of big political change. And underlying that, even above what Ganesh was talking about with India and China, you, you have a, a, a big change in the model of globalization that we've been talking about. I, I think I would differ to, to some degree from the ambassadors to the fact that these models of globalization are going to get rejected, but they're certainly going to be changed. That the type of growth that was brought over most of the last 20, 25 years, driven by greater financial integration and particularly large transformative trade deals. It, it doesn't seem to me that that is going to happen again. We were having a discussion about the prospects for RCEP, the ASEAN plus six China-led trade agreement, which may or may not happen, but is unlikely to have the type of uh, growth enhancing capability uh, that previous rounds of trade agreements have had. But, as Ganesh said, you now have a, a new era of mega regional connectivity initiatives, of which BRI is the largest, but um, you also have the beginnings of the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, led by Japan and India, much smaller at the moment, $40, $50 billion worth of funding, but could plausibly grow. Japan has pots of money of its own, as does ASEAN, and that will become a source of growth as will the, the whole bundle of technology, technological changes that go under the, the, the sort of banner of the fourth industrial revolution, which creates enormous opportunities here in South Asia, particularly, you know, you have more white collar outsourcing, lots of lawyers and bankers and doctors in the West who should be worried about activities partially that can now be done in India or Sri Lanka or the Philippines. Um, but equally, you have problems of premature industrialization where it has become much more difficult for countries like Sri Lanka or India is the, probably the most obvious in this part of the world to mimic the growth strategies that every other um, Asian country that has moved from poverty to middle income status and onwards to something approaching or you know, full sort of industrialized status, they've all done it the same way. Um, and it's very difficult to see that India can follow that path. So the, the kind of economic situation is more complicated. So the third point then is this question of where are we going on regional order. Um, South Asia, as both uh, of our previous speakers mentioned, becomes the kind of a much more interesting place over the next 20 years than the last 20 because it becomes the fastest growing region. Uh, you know, India, the fastest growing large economy. The rim between India and Africa, in a sense, 
will begin to replace the Pacific Rim as the, the locus of global growth. Um, but nonetheless, it also becomes one of the great sites of geopolitical competition because it's clearly in this part of the world that India is going to begin to resist um, China most strongly. And that means that exactly the world that Harsha used, so balancing smaller nations will have to learn how to balance more effectively. You can already see some lessons from elsewhere around Asia. So um, uh, countries in ASEAN, uh, some are choosing to join what some characterize as a new Chinese tributary system, um, Lao, Myanmar to some degree, Cambodia, you know, countries who decide basically that they're, they're, their self-interest is going to be to sign up to China um, much more closely. Sri Lanka, I think, can see some of the risks of that strategy over the last decade and has decided probably rightly to go in a different direction. Um, but equally, you see increasingly in other parts of Asia a sort of corresponding reaction um, amongst countries who've decided that they need to change their behavior in response to the way that China is behaving. Um, you see that, you saw that in Rex Tillerson's speech last week, um, sort of charting a much more pro-India policy from the US. You saw it uh, three weeks ago when Modi and Abe met. Um, you see it in the return of the, the talk of the Quad, Australia, India, Korea, Japan. Um, the thing that is clear about this is that, that this is not something that is sort of partially being shaped by America, but is no longer being led by America. Uh, but the other thing that is clear, and again, this I think is where I would differ slightly from the ambassador, is that the kind of trajectory of relations between the main powers seems pretty clear to me that India and China's relations are getting less good. America and China's relations are also getting less good, and America and India are becoming closer. Um, and in a sense, India and Japan are also becoming closer in this. So this seems like a pretty clear pattern, but one that is much more complicated for a country like Sri Lanka to try and manage the, the balancing between all of these different moving parts. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you go? Okay, fine. All right. <laughs> I have given a message. That's right. Okay. Anyway, the, the, thank you very much, James. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, that was an excellent summary uh, of the dynamics of the um, geopolitical landscape uh, that a country like Sri Lanka has to uh, navigate. Um, the program requires the moderator to say, uh, make a contribution as well. So let me let me say share some thoughts with you. I'm going to deviate a little bit from what I was originally going to say at the beginning because James has prodded me into thinking uh, uh, that I should share this thought with you. James spoke about the about in his second term, China's V is going to be prodding the global order uh, more vigorously uh, in terms of trying to change it, and that in fact the four strong uh, leaders uh, in the Eurasian um, region will all want to change the order to some extent. And it's worth recalling how the last phase of globalization ended. The last great phase of globalization was the late 19th century and early 20th century. And it ended when the system was not able to accommodate the rise of Germany and Japan. And we had two world wars and, and, and a great depression. Uh, because the system was not able to make that change in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a way that maintained stability. Of course, today we have a whole architecture of multilateral institutions which didn't exist at that time. The League of Nations failed. So I think making a, what I am doing is making a plea for multilateralism, that these changes that are inevitable need to be negotiated within the multilateralist framework. Uh, the hegemonic power doesn't seem to be, at the moment anyway, inclined to do that. I hope at some point that would change uh, because that's the way we can, make, can have shared prosperity around the world. On uh, the implications of the rise, and rise of China and India, let me take each of them in turn. India, we've had proximity, clearly. Uh, and, and 
substantial links, but we've never been able to maximize uh, proximity uh, because both countries, from an economic perspective, because both countries have had terrible infrastructure. So they, though we were only 20 miles away, the ports and airports didn't work, the roads were terrible, so it really couldn't do business with each other in a very effective way. But what is changing is that infrastructure in both countries is improving and improving significantly. So the, the benefits or the advantages of proximity are now becoming amplified. So I think that's going to create more opportunities. Um, Ganeshan, uh, in his presentation, said that there will be a billion people in each of China and India joining, uh, become, attaining middle class status by 2030. So these billion people in India and in China will want stuff to buy, goods and services to buy. And certainly we are 20 miles from India and the, the most dynamic part of the Indian economy uh, comprises the five southern states. So that has to be an opportunity. Uh, um, so proxy, now I think we can really take advantage of proximity to a far greater extent going forward. The second thing is I think the in, uh, Indians um, uh, foreign policy establishment, uh, the Modi government has talked about uh, a neighborhood first policy. Uh, to be fair, I think even the Manmohan Singh government did begin to move in that direction. The Indian establishment, I think, has worked out that for, it, for the country, for their country to um, achieve the global ambitions they have for it, uh, they can't afford to have instability in their neighborhood. Uh, if they're firefighting in the neighborhood, clearly that's going to be a distraction in terms of their broader global ambitions. So I think they're now more committed to prosperity and stability in the region. You can see a lot of things happening in the northeast of the subcontinent. Uh, road and transit links between India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal uh, are improving. Uh, there is connect grid connectivity between those countries and Bhutan is there as well. Uh, so you can see that India has, uh, and I think Prime Minister Modi has been, has he been here twice or three times? Uh, twice. twice. Twice in the two years that this government has been in power. Uh, so I think there is a, a, a sea change in the way India views the neighborhood. So we need to take advantage of that. So that's a second advantage. Uh, the third advantage is, is associated with the Make in India strategy. If you look at what happened in East and Southeast Asia, um, first when Japan grew and then China grew, a lot of the countries in the region were able to benefit by hooking into the supply chains um, um, around um, and, and first Japan and then China. Um, South Asia has not had that opportunity because the major economy, uh, India, was not very successful in terms of its industrialization and what industrialization it had was very inward looking uh, and didn't really create opportunities uh, for um, production sharing uh, networks. If the Made in India strategy works, then it's quite possible that one might be able to recreate what happened in East and Southeast Asia, whereby countries in South Asia may be able to benefit by linking into the supply chains that grow around the uh, growing manufacturing sector in India. Now, um, and these, these are kind of underlying uh, trends uh, which uh, hopefully will create a greater opportunity for Sri Lanka to take advantage of what is happening in, in India and as Ganeshan pointed out, the growth momentum in India is likely to be maintained. It slipped a bit in the last five quarters, there has been declining growth but there are short-term short reasons uh, which have caused this, the demonetization, the, the, the GST, the initial hitches with GST uh, have been two reasons, but those are temporary uh, phenomena which I think uh, should uh, uh, move out of the way and in Indian growth should pick up again. So there's a growing Indian economy, um, billion people joining uh, the middle class status uh, in the next 12-13 uh, years uh, and we're 20 miles away and the transaction costs of doing business with India uh, is declined. And another point I should make, is the GST. I mean, having a 
one nation, one market, as the Indians like to, to talk about uh, GST, will create opportunities for people trading with India. It will be a lot easier to trade in India. Some of the, the non-tariff uh, barriers and the, the, the factors which increased trade costs in India are likely to come down as well. So that's India. Clearly the opportunities uh, for us in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka will be amplified in my view if we are able to finalize the EDCA agreement which will not only open up um, a greater scope in terms of the trade in goods that we have under the Indian FTA but also include services, training technology uh, and, and, and investment. Um, if I can turn to China, uh, clearly being smack bang in the middle of the maritime silk route uh, is a significant advantage uh, and as Ganeshan pointed out, the Chinese are going to shift billions of dollars uh, through these through our two arteries, the, the maritime and the, the, the land-based uh, 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 routes that they have identified uh, for their, their kind of Marshall Plan Plus that they have, uh, they have embarked upon. Um, in addition to that, of course, we've had excellent bilateral relations right from the Rubber Rice Pact in 1952. Uh, and uh, China has been a very steadfast uh, friend of Sri Lanka uh, through uh, good times and bad. Uh, and uh, that plus the <coughs> capital they have to recycle and our strategic location uh, means that there is clearly a great opportunity. And again, if we are able to finalize the partnership agreement with China, uh, then that is going to make things a lot easier as well. Again, it's, it's about, about trading goods and services, investment, training, technology, all that, which we're trying to do with India, we're trying to do with China as well. Um, so what, what are the channels through which we like to do benefit? And the, the, the channels really are similar to both countries, more trade, more investment, uh, more tourism, uh, more technology transfer, uh, more training, uh, all these are available uh, through our relationships uh, with these two countries. So, uh, location, uh, excellent uh, bilateral relations at the moment with both countries. Um, if you bring all that together, uh, really there is a considerable opportunity out there for Sri Lanka, particularly if we are able to establish preferential market access through these agreements that we are negotiating. But to do that, as the Deputy Minister pointed out, uh, we've got to balance well. We've got to balance things off well. And um, a very, the ambassador of a very important country, when I kind of basically tried to um, repeat uh, the Deputy Minister's vision to him as far as our uh, economic diplomacy was concerned, he said, uh, what you seem to be talking about is strategic promiscuity. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what we need. Thank you very much. Now with that, let me um, open up the, uh, uh, the uh, open, open the discussion out to the floor. Um, if there's anybody who would like to uh, uh, ask any questions, make a contribution. Daniela. See, Clary, okay, please do. Yeah, Sarah. Uh, my question is, My questions, I suppose, underscore what I consider to be the primacy of the political in all of this. And if I may, it's, it's twofold. One is directed to Ghanaian in terms of your very illuminating presentation. What I wanted to ask you is as to whether the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, have any role to play in terms of this comparison between the two Asian drives. And in particular, whether there is anything especially important about the goal number 16, which deals with the governance and rule of law and equality before the law and all of that, in terms of this competition, as it were, between these two giants. And my second question is to Harsha, in terms of the point you made about the visits of nuclear warships and the, the contingency with which the political uh, does manifest itself. You know, there was a time when Sri Lanka proposed an Indian Ocean peace zone. 
and was thinking in much broader uh, terms as to stability and rule-based regimes in this region. Is it possible, is it being contemplated in terms of our foreign policy to think of a rules-based regime with regard to the military, the political, the economic for this region, and is there an initiative there for us to take? Uh, can I take? Sure, please, please. Because please. I have to leave in the next two minutes. Um, is, yes, Sarah, the answer is yes. Um, it has to be broadly based on the United Nations Convention of the Sea UNCLOS. Uh, of course, there are um, uh, you know, codes of conduct, uh, and whether we can get to a code of conduct in the Indian Ocean um, is something that we need to try and you know, put all our heads together and see. And that does not mean just the players in the region, but the players outside the region. Um, so yes, there is an initiative. The first time the Prime Minister spoke about was in in uh, in Australia uh, about uh, uh, eight months ago, when he said that Sri Lanka was willing to take the initiative to see if he can bring all the players together uh, to start working on some sort of code of conduct uh, in the Indian Ocean. We see what's happening in the South Pacific uh, or uh, the, the South China Sea, rather. Uh, yes, true, there is no real conflict here right now. It seems to be peaceful, all well and good. But what we need to do is to ensure it is in our interest also, if we are going to be positioned as, or we want to become the center of the Indian Ocean, to ensure that there is freedom of navigation and overflight uh, across the Indian Ocean, to ensure that not just military, but commercial, political interests are, 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 are managed in the way that it is equitable to all players, large and small. Um, and the, the third question also is yes, in that we are, uh, perhaps this is the first time talking about it publicly, that uh, attempting to uh, have a conference by the end of next year. Uh, and um, we are in the process of uh, bringing uh, interested parties together. There is, there is tremendous interest from countries both near and far. Um, and uh, we have put together a small group uh, to start thinking about. Kanesh is a key member of that uh, little uh, <laughs> team. Um, and we are hopeful uh, that we'll be able to have some consensus by the end of next year, at least on some sort of broad framework on a uh, rules-based order. Uh, I don't want to say a code of conduct because that's part of it. So yes, so we are uh, taking that initiative. So if you excuse me, I told the initiative that I have to leave sharp at six. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think there was a question for you, Manish, as sure. well, right? So the question on the SDGs, um, short answer is the environmental stuff I think will get done because both are signed up to the Paris Agreement and pollution is a major problem and so on and green technology is a big opportunity. So the SDG, no problem. In terms of the governance issues, China is approaching it in the anti-corruption mode. Right? So 100 and 50 vice ministers and governors, 1,500 whatever officials. Um, democracy, democratization, rule of law. China has, interesting, the judicial numbers you saw are quite good. India will be more complex, uh, ironically, I feel. Um, but um, I, I think they will take bits when it makes sense to their strategy, and other bits will be there as needed. <laughs> OK. Any more? One over the back. Over the back, please. One oh, no. here and one there. Uh, my question is to uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh Raja. Now, I think uh, the governor of the central bank was uh, referring to strategic uh, promiscuity at one point, as it was quoted. My question is, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's a, uh, I mean, we uh, we as Sri Lankans should focus on leveraging on this strategic. Uh, 
uh, let's say uh, geopolitical uh, play within the Indian Ocean in my personal opinion between uh, especially China and India and Sri Lanka in the center. But this is not a very, uh, let's say, it will be a very arduous road to take, I mean, for a small country like ours. But uh, I think there is no alternative also. But uh, what are the challenges you foresee in uh, trekking down this road and what is the strategy that is being evolved to, uh, let's say, manage these impossible partners, so to speak? Thank you. Janishan, yes. So um, I'm not an international relations specialist, <laughs> even though I've been taught by uh, Pakya Sobi here. Um, but I would guess um, we should attempt to first try to get these two trade agreements done. Mm -hmm. And in terms of sequencing, for me, the one with China, I think, is the obvious one, because my sense of it is that is a political agreement. It's not an economic agreement. And you don't negotiate with China if you're a small country the way we are, and China being the large market. It would be an everything but arms agreement. And we should ideally get access for 10 years before China comes and gets access to our market. And one hopes that that's what's being discussed with a lot of special and differentiated treatment plus a trade adjustment bill. Yeah? If we get an agreement with China, I think we will get an agreement with India rather quickly for obvious reasons. So, so, so we should set out our stall in a very clear way, but the Chinese agreement to me is a very clear political agreement. And they would want a rules-based order because they're major investors in the future in Sri Lanka. And that is what is in for them. So that would be the way I would attempt to do it. And then the aid, of course. Uh, would be the other part of the engagement. And China is already here, as we all know, in the port in Hambantota, and they're offering a lot of technical assistance. We should take it, and, and I think we should try to manage that as best as we can mm. on economic terms. James? I mean, I, I, I would just, so I'm now based in Singapore, <coughs> and I know that your prime minister is a great admirer of Singapore, as are many people in Sri Lanka. I, I think Singapore has some lessons for small countries in an era of kind of great power of geopolitics. Lee Kuan Yew always used to kind of read the riot act to the people of Singapore saying, you know, you have to learn that you are price takers in the world economy. You basically have to do what the great powers want. Um, and, and so Singapore manages a, a sort of curious double act, which I think Sri Lanka would be quite wise to follow, that on the one hand, in its view of the world, it's a sort of uber realist, a very acute and sharp observer of the kind of ups and downs of of the, the, the powers around it, not just the big ones, but also its neighbors to the north and south, brutally realist in its outlook. But, and this is to echo Harsha now that he's gone, Singapore is also the, probably the greatest advocate for a, a rules-based system as well, that it recognizes that in the end, that those who think that an era of multipolarity or great power competition is good for small countries. There are people who think that, that it gives you more leverage. You can kind of play one off against the other. And you know, if you're clever, you might get some advantage out of it. But actually, this is probably a short-sighted view, and that it is better to have a, 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 some sort of rules-based system in which everyone has some de degree of predictability. And so Singapore, not just throughout ASEAN, but elsewhere, is a, you know, the, the, in, in its own way, probably the greatest supporter of that system around Asia. And that strikes me as a good balance that Sri Lanka could, kind of, could copy, which is to become brutally realist in its observation of what's going on, but pro a rules-based order in its contribution. And that's probably the best balance to strike. If I may just say something there as well. I think it's useful to try to understand how each of the two countries view us. As far as India is concerned, I think probably the most vivid description uh, was in Shiv Shankar Menon, you know, the former National Security Advisor and Foreign Secretary's book, where he says, um, I think Sri Lanka is like an aircraft carrier parked 20 miles off the coast of India. That is the kind of perception that Indian strategic thinkers, thinkers have of Sri Lanka, where within their defense perimeter. So that's how India looks at it. Sri Lanka, and we need to understand that and to interact, uh, taking that into account. For the Chinese, you know, the Chinese, historically anyway, have been extremely cautious and prudent. Uh, you know, they're, they're not very cavalier, they're not adventurous at all, or have not been so far. And for them, 
to take India on in Sri Lanka, to me, doesn't make any sense at all. I don't, I don't think there's enough to gain for that. Um, so, if you look, take both those things into account, we need to calibrate our balancing, taking those two things into account. And, and, and you know, I think we can have a very good commercial relationship with both countries. Uh, just one little point. Uh, I think uh, what we need to really develop is our location. Uh, once you have that aspect clear, that we should not try to stop anyone making use of that particular uh, asset of our uh, location mm -hmm. between India and Sri Lanka, between China passing through, all that type of thing from the old days, where even Cheng He and all these people sort of used Sri Lanka as part of that. And even distant places like uh, the United States, still, whether it's tourism or anything else like that, the location of Sri Lanka, I think, is something that needs to be very well worked out. And for that, we need to work out some sort of strategy to allow a certain use of that location. And I think uh, we had some difficulties, for example, about the Colombo port, that there was a conflict between India and China as to what was going to happen. So now it has come to us and the port is developing and that I think has an enormous uh, advantage purely because of the location. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You Do you want to say something? Are you going to permit the last word? Uh, yes, most certainly. <laughs> most certainly for each of, each of them. I, there was somebody who had their hand up there. Yeah. Uh, my question was uh, to be directed towards Honorable Sir Harshadi Silva, but Rather, any of you could answer. <laughs> As a student of uh, Model United Nations, something that we MUNers usually discuss, or rather a vague question that we have, is um, what would be the reassurance to the citizens of Sri Lanka, uh, considering this excessive engagement with China, that the Chinese, no offense, but Chinese would rather like uh, Dr. Harsha Desila stated, would capture our assets and use them in some sort of negative way. Or, or rather, this question could be uh, understood in another way, or Mr. Ganeshan could uh, um, predict according to... Is there, is there any way to predict according to statistical data or any sort of data, if they, this sort of thing could eventually happen to Sri Lanka, would we be a victim of uh, such um, would we be a victim of any foreign country once again to our country? Can anyone want to take that? Yeah, please. So I think one of the interesting principles is this notion of comparative advantage, right? So if you if you believe that there are gains from trade and investment um, done carefully. Uh, that can be beneficial to a country like Sri Lanka, right? But we also have to have, for trade investment to work properly, we have to have a very good uh, domestic regulatory system. So on something like competition policy, you want to avoid monopolies being there, be they local or foreign, right? So we have a very good regulation of competition. Uh, so if you have a giant Chinese monopoly that suddenly gets set up through a big investment, that can be regulated properly. So that's one way you do this, right? A second thing is to ensure that um, you know, there's fair entry and exit uh, of firms, right? So Sri Lankan firms can also get into those industries. So we don't reserve, let's say, zones or areas or even sectors for, for investors per se, but we provide equal incentives. Um, so these are, these are ways in which you can do. Um, the theory of asset stripping is a very common one that's put up. Um, I think, I think the, the trick with that is to try to ensure that, that, that you have a, a regime that allows other investors to also come in. You look at the offers, and then you look at the benefits and costs that might come from that. Uh, in the case of something like the airline, there don't seem to be much takers, right? So you have a problem there. Right? That runs as a loss, or you close it down. But in other sectors where Sri Lanka is attractive, um, you know, there may be many who may be interested, including local firms. So that's the way you want to try to approach that. And a lot of it is, depends on whether you believe in comparative advantage or you believe in something else. And, so since you're a student of MUN, uh, maybe study comparative advantage. Mm. James, you want to say I, I mean, this is just a, a sort of slightly related point about the, um, 
So we've almost got through a, a, more than an hour and a half of discussion. We barely mentioned the United States except to talk about its absence. Um, as a representative of the declining West, I suppose I, thought, I felt like I should say um, that, that when you're thinking about balancing between India and China, um, you know, don't forget about America. Yeah. The current, and you, at the moment you see a lot of economic balancing around Asia, but not very much security balancing. It takes a long time to do this. Even you know, countries like the Philippines who have the, you know, political leaders who have um, been playing footsie with China haven't actually undone any of their security um, alliances in a meaningful way. This is going to take a long time. Um, and the current American administration, touch wood, will only be there you know, for another two and a half years or something. Um, and then it may be that a, 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 a sort of return to a degree of normality. Now, that doesn't mean that the trajectory that Ganesh has, has uh, sketched out is going to change. Um, but it does mean that, that the sort of self-destructive impulse uh, of the West may, we hope, be a, be a temporary phenomenon. And in a sense, you should all hope that it will be, because the best thing that can happen in any of these scenarios is that the transition from one sort of order that has been led by the West to another happens gradually and without any big disruptions. And you know, the, the, in particular, to, to your question about what might happen to Sri Lanka in this, I mean, I, I think if um, the global order takes on the type of characteristics of the Chinese internal order, then small countries like Sri Lanka have quite a lot to worry about and that, that there should be no celebration um, of the idea of a, of a sort of new Sinosphere. This is quite an alarming prospect and it would be much better to have a, a, a gradual and relatively peaceful multilateral change over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, that's, that's the scenario we should all be hoping for. And so in that scenario, the best scenario is one in which America sort of returns to the trajectory that it was on before the last election. Sure. Maybe we have time for just one more question. No. Oh, yeah. Last one. Thank you, Honorable. Um, and uh, my question is to Mr. Ganesh Raja. Uh, so China is uh, not only invested in, in Sri Lanka, it has made in heavy investment in Pakistan, and also like for like uh, a new corridor has been opened. And also there has been mainly, for example, if you take like, there are one port city building in Pakistan, and another port city is building in Bangladesh. So what are the effects will be uh, on this to Sri Lanka, like how can we compete it like in this arena? So, like. so um, essentially, our challenge is to try to make you know our ports more competitive than the ports in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, uh, and that means really good logistics. It means good infrastructure, um, and some of that is also transshipment. So hopefully, some of that trade will also come through. So on the one end, we'll be competing directly with them, but on the other hand, we may also participate in transshipment trade through logistics and other means. So that, that's what our challenge has got to be. We've got to try to make these things work. Okay, I'm going to give each of the panelists a couple of minutes and then let Ganesh have the last word. Sala, you want to make a few <laughs> concluding remarks? Yes, thank you. I, <clears throat> my time was up, so I couldn't talk about the one uh, final issue I wanted to raise, and that is this issue of small states with big neighbors. And um, in this relation, I think uh, you were talking very much in rigid of the benefits of location and uh, proximity, being close to global supply chains and so on. But the, there has been um, a real question of why we have not been able to draw the full benefits of all of this. And maybe there are different options that are available for small states with big neighbors. In security studies, we talk of balancing bandwagoning and so on. But about uh, some months ago, there was a brilliant lecture here by Professor Lim, who looked at Hong Kong, China, and Singapore, 
uh, how they prospered as port cities and so on, and how they took a very different direction with regard to economic diplomacy. And uh, because of the constitutional requirements and what has happened now, Hong Kong, his concluding picture was Hong Kong is becoming more a city in China. And he said, contrast that with Singapore, which from the beginning stepped itself out as a global city and plugged itself into the uh, international economic system. And which way is it that we in Sri Lanka want to go? Or is there a middle way between the two that we, we need to take and we need to look at? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, James. Um, two very brief points. One uh, is, in a sense, a response to the questioner at the front, which is this issue of location. I mean, I, 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 I'm sort of tempted to say that Sri Lanka has to be a bit careful with this. There are lots and lots of countries that are close to global sea ship, you know, if you look at the map, that are close to where the ships go, close to great powers. In the end, Singapore, the other small countries that have done well do this by, by improving their governance. Um, and so a fanatical approach on good governance um, and the type of uh, administrative arrangement that will attract investment seems to be um, a much better route to prosperity in the coming era than thinking about location. The second thing I would say is just to think about India. So I've just finished writing a book about India, uh, which will be out next year in all good airports and bookshops. You should all buy it. It's called The Billionaire Raj. Um, but it sort of strikes me we've just spent a lot of time thinking about what Mr. Xi in China is going to do in his second term. But this, the question of what Modi is going to do in his second term, which I think we all assume he's going to win, um, that's interesting. I, I mean, as he... Uh, contemplates you know, his second period in power and his uh, likely legacy, only the fourth Indian prime minister with the, with the likely opportunity to serve two full terms in office, it strikes me that you can already begin to see the, the outlines of a much more aggressive, um, I don't even mean that in a bad way, an expansionist regional India's sense of itself. You already have Mr. Jayashankar, the foreign secretary, talking about India as a leading power um, in, in the region. Um, and so it, this is, in a sense, inspired by your thought that as Singapore, for instance, has to cope with its relationship with China, then Sri Lanka is going to have to cope with a, a relationship with, with India that conceives of itself and begins to act as a regional power in Modi's second term. And beginning to kind of prepare for that and think that through seems to me uh, probably the most important priority for Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ganesh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so really, there are going to be two big things happening. One is we're going to have a multipolar world economy with no question, China, India, US, EU, and others. And we've got to think of that. The second big trend is technological change and disruptive technology. There's going to be artificial intelligence, which can whack the BPO industry. There's going to be robotics. There's something called Sobot, um, which will destroy the garment industry if we don't watch out. Um, that can make a T-shirt um, with plastic uh, very efficiently. So, that industry is also under threat. So for Sri Lanka, there are three things. Uh, one is we've got to build a flexible and nimble economy. And that, to me, means the supply side reform. Um, it's about uh, building the skills of our people so we can compete properly. We have underinvested in education, and I think that's a terrible problem. We haven't spent enough on infrastructure, particularly broadband connectivity. We've got to do something about that. And we've got to finance our firms. Um, terribly important. Um, the second important thing is we've got to be friends with everyone and not annoy anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not being promiscuous, that's just being very strategic and very clear about how we manage our international relations. Um, and I think we've made a good start on that. And then we've got to look at sub-regional cooperation as well as global government support. Um, so I think we've got a good future if we do the right things now. Thank you. Just to wind up, I, you know, I think uh, some key messages the world is changing, it's likely to become more multipolar. We all hope that it will be uh, done in a stable multilateral, within a stable multilateral framework. India and China contribute 60%, over 60% to global growth, the delta. Uh, so clearly uh, their weight in the global economy is going to increase. We have location, we have excellent external relations. We are in a position to leverage the, the geopolitical dynamics of the Indian Ocean uh, to our benefit. So if one brings all that together, if Sri Lanka 
boxes smart, as the Americans like to say, uh, we certainly uh, have, have considerable opportunities that we can grasp to our advantage. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Let me thank. <laughs> Let me say a special word of thanks uh, to Ganeshan uh, and, and uh, Sarla and, and uh, James. And I think Dinusha is going to wind up. Thank you very much, uh, Ganesh, for a rich lecture and um, an equally enormous thank you uh, to Dr. Kumar Sami and our panelists for their plethora of insights on China-India dynamics and what it means for Sri Lanka. Uh, you did such a great job of summing up. I'm not going to, uh, uh, to go into the, to the substance of it, uh, except to say it was wonderful to end on a positive note uh, and uh, to recognize implicitly that Sri Lanka is actually developing these two broad frameworks uh, that it's involved in, the BRI on the one hand, the existing framework, but the newer framework that it's developing in, as the center of the Indian Ocean. And perhaps the, the topic for the next lecture is how we can use the Indian Ocean framework of normative standards to counteract some of the risks that were properly identified about labor, environment, and so forth from the BRI. Uh, so that's, that, that's something that uh, we, we might want to explore, and we've, we've certainly had um, a lot of different countries in, involved in the BRI talking to us about the possibility of actually doing this together, forming the, the identifying the risks together, and working towards a common declaration of standards for the BRI that could help possibly offset some of those risks. So thank you very much um, for introducing so many ideas. Uh, remains for me to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our, our consistent a supporter in so many ways uh, without which this event would not have been possible a and also to thank my colleagues uh, ably led by Anishka De Silva who organized today's event. Thanks, thank you all for coming. Um, please do join us on the veranda outside for cake and tea. Thank you. <laughs>